We have returned. It is us again, the Cinnamon. I'm is, here with Doug Davison. Are we? Are are we the 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 we? We are the them. We are the titular the. Oh, okay. Yes, we are the. So who's the Cinnamon then? Oh, that's them. That's them. That's them. Oh, okay. Yeah. This feels very. When will then be now? <laughs> Later. <laughs> <laughs> Soon. Uh, how are you doing today, sir? I'm I'm actually doing pretty good. Yes, it has been quite some time. We took the. Did we take the entire month of November off? No, we did record once in November. Okay, November we lasted did. about three years. Yeah, <laughs> it certainly feels like it. Things have been uh, a little crazy on both our ends. You've got 40 million podcasts uh, and then about uh, 40 million other side hustles. Uh, my semester is woohoo winding down. Yeah. I've got one class left, and award season has just been kicking my butt, too. Mm-hmm. So that, uh, then, you know, you did some traveling, I got sick. Uh, you know, life. 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 Did you have a fun trip? I did. I did. Um, <laughs> I was keeping said trip on the low, but that's all right. Um, diddly, 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 diddly. <laughs> We're going to edit this out. <laughs> no, nah, it was cool. I actually got some time to uh, to research, or some downtime, I should say, to research some stuff for Secret Project number two. Ooh. So getting that all off the what ground soon. Tell us what it is we want to know. It's called Secret for a Reason, Doug. I actually know by the time they hear this... Uh, I don't know where we're putting this up. Nope, they will not have it. Nope. <laughs> but I wasn't sure hear, what noise you were making there for a minute. I was like, do you, need a mi- do, you, do you need a minute? <laughs> By the time they hear next episode, I will have announced it, but oh, not right for on. this episode. Yeah. Tell, us, tell us anyway. No, it's not going to happen, us. sir. Not going to happen. If you donate to the Patreon, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, give us that money. Give us that sweet, sweet ducats. www.patreon.com slash podcast. <laughs> what have you been watching lately, sir? Uh, or is there any, any news, anything you want to get to? The one at the day of this recording, uh, sometime today, the Wonder Woman trailer would drop. Yeah, it's uh, 1230, I think it is, Pacific time is when it's dropping because they're releasing it. At a convention in Brazil? Yes. I forget the initials for it. I'm not familiar. CCX like, or something like that? CCPX? CCPX, yes. Something like that? Something like that. Yeah, uh, down in Brazil. got a little bit of uh, footage from uh, The Eternals, the uh, Marvel movie that comes out next year as well. Oh, really? Yes. Those are, I think we only get two next year, Black Widow and Eternals? I think, yeah, they're they're dropping down to about one to two a year for a little while, which is good. Yeah. Particularly with all the TV shows that they're dropping, it actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah, they know what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so that makes it about 3.30 EST. Yep. Which I don't know why we're talking about this. You will have seen it by the time we hear this. So, or you might great, not right? have, or you, or you might, you might not, not have. have. Well, nah, it'll be all. Have you seen the teaser sure. though? I saw the teaser. And I was like, ah, yeah, it's a teaser for a trailer. Well, yeah, but she's literally lassoing lightning. How can you not love the <laughs> hell out of that? <laughs> I'll love the hell of it when I see it in the actual trailer. I was just like, yeah, that looks pretty cool. But you saw That's... a snippet of the trailer. That is part of the trailer. I mean, granted, a teaser trailer is only a little annoying because it's we're getting a trailer for the trailer for yeah, the movie. It was just absolutely ridiculous, which is why I was just like, okay, whatever. Just give me the whole trailer. At least it's not as bad as the teaser literally attached to the trailer you're about to watch. Those I drive me nuts. Those. I think that he had that for the last wait a minute, 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 wait a minute. A teaser trailer, which is about 30 seconds of the full trailer you're about to see, which is literally designed to get you excited for what you're about to witness, mm-hmm. get you talking about it so that people will show up for the release. <laughs> that you have a problem with, but the you're watching the trailer, but they're going to show you a teaser of that trailer literally before you watch it. That you're okay with? Yeah, that I'm okay with. Because I know as soon as that bullshit gets done, then I'm going to get the trailer, and I'm good with that. And this one, I, I, don't, don't give me the day in advance. Just go ahead and give me the damn trailer. <sighs> it's not I'm not that sure I, what that noise it, you're making it, is there. So. Uh, it's frustration. <laughs> It's frustration. Uh, okay, I get the fact that just release the trailer. I literally have no problem with yeah, that. Just release the trailer. I am, I am excited about that. But at the same time, there's something to be said for, from a marketing perspective, about trying to create an event out of this. People have been excited. Those that enjoyed Wonder Woman, mm-hmm. of which I am one of those people, mm-hmm. uh, just recently did the 4K upgrade when it was on cheap, cheap sale at Best Buy during Black Ooh. Friday. It looks gorgeous. I just got my 4K TV. I have not yet purchased a 4K Blu-ray. I can make some recommendations. All right. May I begin with Star Wars The Last Jedi? Uh, yes, that's a beautiful but, movie. But in addition to that, and before all that, Mad Max Fury Road. Yes. I'm sure we'll be talking about those at some point in either this or the next podcast. But um, it looks gorgeous, but people have been excited to see what they were going to do with Wonder Woman after that in 1984, certainly. Just the timing seems kind of interesting. Uh, uh, yes, it's 1984. 
Well, no, I just mean Cold War and stuff like that. Uh -huh. So I'm kind of curious what they're going to do with that, period. I'm less interested in how they're going to bring in uh, Chris Pine again. But you say you're less interested? I'm yeah, I'm less curious about that. I'm uh, more curious. Like, how are you going to bullshit your way through this? Yeah, that's more of why I'm I'm trying not to get too invested in that particular aspect. No, I'm all in for because that because it's either going to be he had this son we didn't know about, uh, or it's his great nephew that just so happens to look like him because he didn't have kids before he went off to war, or it's a specter. And either way, I'm like me, or so, it's comic books. And it's just Steve Trevor. <laughs> <laughs> I like Which, how you ruled out like the most obvious comic book answer of all time. They managed to do it with Bucky. They can do it with Steve Trevor. <laughs> Different universe, but Bucky Same was... Same principles. No, Bucky fell into ice. F Steve from how Trevor. Far up? From how high up? Steve Trevor. Steve Trevor. Mm -hmm. Exploded. Exploded. <laughs> so unless he got stitched together like... Jigsaw style? I like it. I like it. I'm all for it. Give me Jigsaw, Steve Trevor. Take away that pretty-ass Chris Pine face. Now let's see you act. They did that. They did that with, um, what was the Assassin movie? Uh, Smoke and Aces. They did. Great very, flipping yeah, movie. Good point. Good point. Love that film. I think it's the first time I've seen Chris Pine. Really? Yeah. I honestly can't remember the... You didn't see Princess Diaries 2? That says a lot about you. <laughs> yes, it, it, it says I didn't see Princess Diaries 2. <laughs> that, I, I worked that sneak when it hit theaters. I was working at Kiss 951 at the time. Yeah. And I was like, well, if I'm going to see this, I guess I should watch the first one. And I like Anne Hathaway. Like I had a crush on her when I was younger. Mm. And I just enjoy her as an actor. Mm. Uh, but yeah, first, the first one is great. The second Princess Diaries is okay. All right, then it's worth here. it's worth watching to just see the cast together. There you go, listeners. You do it for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what a movie! So challenge, you say? <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I will try my best to bullshit my way through that challenge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the the second act is amazing. Uh, I, I couldn't believe they just got to conquer America. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what? Right, yeah. I'm going to throw in some bullshit to find out if you ever watched it. <laughs> Alfred Hitchcock was there, which I thought was a... I, who knew they kept that really low-key? Did, did you really enjoy the uh, surprise announcement of Wakanda as part of the <laughs> merger between the two countries? <laughs> they went to war with Aaron for some reason. <laughs> I didn't see it coming, but I enjoyed it. Enjoy it. <laughs> That's right, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, by the way, uh, to get us back on track, Ar speaking of Arendelle, have you seen Frozen 2 by any chance? No. Uh, I was going to take the little one, but the little one's mom got to it first. I oh, know, I should think uh, her whole Girl Scout troop wanted to go see it all together. So I was like, ah, one last thing for you to worry about. Right on. Totally, totally get that. I was surprised that I enjoyed the hell out of that. I have been fortunate enough to, uh, with it being award season, that I was able to watch it also at home. I've seen it four times now. That's a bit much. See, so you say that. And I mean it. I know you do. But think about any movie that you've enjoyed. Think about how many times you've watched it. Eh. So keep in mind, I watched it in the theater for review. Watched it to uh, just because I could after that when it showed up at home. Then showed it to my wife, mm -hmm. who does not like Disney all that much. She's now becoming a modern Disney fan is what she would say. Uh, classic Disney she still struggles with. And then we just showed it to Connor, who had not seen Frozen until two days prior to watching it the second time. Oh, there you go. So for me, four times was also just showing it to people. But uh, it's really good. I like it a lot better than the first. Oh, I like heard, the songs better, too. heard the opposite from a lot of people. I know. And uh, maybe they had happier childhoods? I don't know. Maybe. Because it speaks to me. Oh, well, there you go. I have an inner Elsa. I think you should let that inner Elsa go. No. Okay. No. It's trying to show, show itself. Oh, Jesus. Hey, you went to let it go, so I had to bring up the other song. You set me up. Don't roll your freaking eyes at me for that. Anywho. 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 Well, but what with, else have you seen? Uh, there's a couple of films that we watch together, but yeah. before we get into those, uh, 1917, which comes out limited on the 25th. Did you say there's a couple of films we've seen together? But aside from that, a film we've seen together. Well, before we get to the ones we watched in okay. the marathon. Uh, okay, all right. You were there with me for 1917, but before we got to the other ones. All right. 1917 is, I know from the scoring, I liked it a little bit more than you. I gave it four to five, I do believe. Yeah, I gave yeah. it a four and a half. There for, you go. For me, it was more because of the technical 
aspects mm-hmm. that uh, that for me brought it. I was originally at a four, but more that I thought about it, I, I lifted it lifted it up to the four and a half. I was impressed as hell by the way that they told that story. Man, Sam Mendes, man, that dude. Mendes and Diggins is a potent combination. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It looks beautiful. It. We we were lucky enough to see it in what RPX, yeah. which is the regal version of IMAX. Right. Uh, it's definitely the kind of experience where if you are interested in 1917 and you don't mind paying for the premium experience, doing an IMAX or RPX is definitely worth it. And if you're not interested in 1917, get interested and then go see it. <laughs> I love that movie, man. It was yeah. really good. I plan on. I think it's a uh, what is it after? It's after Star Wars, right? Yeah, it, it's limited release on the 25th and then wider release in January. They're right, trying then. to hit that Oscar window. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will probably, my, my usual Christmas tradition is do all the Christmas BS with the family and then dip out to go see a movie that evening. Um, so I will I probably. Be jealous. Yes, be jealous, sir. And I am planning on going to see that Christmas day. I assume it's probably just going to be a regal because it seems like any any limited joint that's Christmas day limited for me ends up being a Regal movie. Like, I had to go to Regal to see uh, Hateful Eight on Christmas Day, mm-hmm. and there's something else I can't, can't think of. Well, but Regal, I think, with Hateful Eight had the uh, The 70 show. millimeter joint. Yeah, exactly. that's right, that's right, that's and right. And this one will be a little different. So if you've you've got uh, the AMC thing, right? Yeah. You don't have the Regal one? I got the AMC thing. Okay. Take a look, because they'll probably have it, and if you can do that at the Dolby Theater oh, up yeah. at Concord Mills, that would be amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, don't, I don't know if Stubbs covers that, though. They do. They do. Yeah. No. The AMC. That's that's the one thing that I really like about theirs. That's the is one it's, thing. Yes. Is that it covers everything. Oh, wow, that's crazy talk. Yeah, because you can do 3D, you can do premium, Dolby, whatever, and it's all counted. All right. Boom. As, unless they've changed it, Regal has the tiered system. Right. Which is smart for them. It's also tiered based on where you live because mm. they're trying to take into account the fact that New York, for instance, prices and L.A. prices are going to be different than, you know, Roanoke, Virginia, yeah. or even Charlotte, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. But, you know. Makes sense. Yeah, I don't have AMC because I can't get to the theater a whole lot. But if I had the ability to do it, yeah, I would get that one in a heartbeat. Yeah, that's per- where it's at. Particularly because for where I live, getting up to Concord Mills, it's not the easiest thing. But uh, I would do that just to see more in their Dolby Theater because I think it's amazing. I'm usually only up at Concord Mills when um, Fathom Events is doing things. They do a lot of stuff. Yeah. Which, which, I have to mention this, uh, and I know we need to get into our main thing of the day, but there's some good stuff that's going on. Mm. Uh, Speaking of Fathom Events, before I forget, this is probably going to drop, what, like the 9th, 10th of December? Yeah. 9th, 10th? Uh, 9th, 10th, and 11th, depending on when this drops, depending on when you listen to it, Promare, it's an animated joint from G-Kids Films. It is my number one favorite animated film of this year. It is hitting theaters again. They're doing what they call a redux of it. I think they've added, not added footage into the film, but they're doing like a thing before the film starts. Mm. And on the 11th, they're doing it in 40X on Regal. Right. They are taking a movie, which is already a bit of a theme park ride, and turning it into a theme park ride. <laughs> Scorsese approves it. <laughs> uh, we're not going to get into that mess. But but I want to go on the 11th. I don't know if I can, if schedule will allow, but I would absolutely love to do it. I checked, and it's about 20 or so dollars for it, which mm-hmm. is a hefty price. But for 4DX, I've done that once. Yeah. And uh, thankfully, it was for a movie I'd seen, Captain Marvel. And yeah, it turned a movie that was pretty entertaining into uh, a fantastic fun ride. There you go. Yeah. So definitely recommend that. Boom. Um, Another movie that came out in, I think, limited release. I'm not sure if it's wide release on December 6th is Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Mm -hmm. I cannot recommend this movie enough. There you go. It it catapulted into my top 10. Catapulted, you say? Yes. Catapulted. Like, I wasn't expecting to enjoy it as much. But the direction is on point. The cinematography is gorgeous. The acting and story is just heartbreaking. But more importantly, because in, in a love of film like this, it's a film about that focuses on two women, one of which is a painter. The other one is the subject. Mm-hmm. And without getting into the rigmarole of everything, uh, the way that everything looks, the way that everything is staged and blocked and set it almost all looks like a painting. Mm-hmm. And there is something to be said about that thoughtfulness 
while you're watching a film. A little Barry Lyndon type action there? Uh, have you ever seen Barry Lyndon? I have not. We've okay. talked about that. But yes, from what I have seen of Barry Lyndon, the fact that Kubrick made sure that everything sort of looked like a living painting. Right. And that's what this evokes. And it is really beautiful. It is a really beautiful film. It is a touching film. And uh, it's not the kind of movie a regular man would make because the male gaze would destroy all the heart from this. But the female gaze is is wonderful. Okay. It's wonderful. So I highly recommend Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Also have to recommend Knives Out. Oh, okay, uh, yeah. That movie, four, four, four from you, and it's like get four. out. <laughs> <laughs> all right. No, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, you can eat shit is basically, I think, the, the yeah. official response. The official response. The anybody response. giving it less than whatever Doug gave it. <laughs> <laughs> eat shit. Eat shit. Eat shit. <laughs> That's a great movie, shit. man. Yeah. I have plans on going to see that uh, at least one more time. It lives up on a rewatch. It, I'm sure it does. Oh, I'm sure it does. Because this time around, without with knowing what happens, watching it the second time, you can sort of see where there were things that were set up yeah, that little, you weren't exactly. Little breadcrumbs for you? A yeah. little bit. Little bit, uh, and it's just this cast is so good, and the script is so on point. After watching it, I, I I'm not trying to brag here, but I ended up having a copy of the screenplay sent, and so I was having a conversation with Crystal after we watched it, and I was like, I, I need to go check something, and I open up the screenplay, and I'm going, oh, oh yeah, no, that's all in there. There's a moment where Tony Collette, who is phenomenal in this, goes to talk to Daniel Craig's. Detective uh, Benoit Blanc. Benoit Blanc. And she calls him Mr. Blank. Yeah. And I was wondering if that was... Did she spe- if you spelled it B-L-A-N-K? Uh-huh. Yeah. I was wondering if that was in the script or if that's just the way she decided to pronounce it. It is in the damn script. Of course it is. Uh, oh, Ryan, you rascal. But it's just the fact that it is so, so cutting that just every character, the way that they deliver their lines, the, the, the intonation that they put behind it is so wonderful. It, it really is a modern-day clue. Oh, uh, 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 I don't know if I'd put it that way, personally. And the reason why is with Clue, you're trying to figure out what's happening as everybody else is figuring it out. Whereas with Knives Out, you know what happens, but it's a matter of how do we get away with it. Mm. Mm. Okay. Because right. we know stuff is set up within the first 30 minutes. And what I like is, and Ryan does this a lot with stuff where he sort of subverts expectations. It's, yeah. it's doing a time travel movie where the movie isn't about time travel. Right. You know? Um, or, hey, we're going to give you Luke, but we're going to make him, you know, Result. human. We're going to make him human yeah. and not superhero. That kind of stuff. And with this, he's like, okay, you are going to, in a whodunit, usually trying to figure out how it happened. Here, we're going to tell you how it happened. But now we're going to make you want to have them get away with it, as it were. Yeah. And it's more complicated than that, of course. But anyway. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the shit out of that movie. Now, we, you joined me for a three-film marathon. We were going to do more, but just time ran out. Uh, just to get us moving, Ford versus Ferrari. How would mm-hmm. you feel? Enjoyed it. <laughs> oh, I thought this was going to be like a rapid fire. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, you can do a little bit more than enjoyed it. Uh, I mean, like I said to you uh, when we got done, I think you kind of interpreted one way as I interpreted another way. And mm-hmm. I interpreted a way as uh, is a good a good story to celebrate man's inventiveness and just taking something that they that they barehandedly made from the ground up and pushed it to its operating limits. Yeah. I find uh, I find those movies kind of interesting. Yeah. And just seeing the, the ingenuity and, and just the competition of how can we how can we outthink these people. There's, you know, there's no violence or fists involved. It's all mm-hmm. brains. It's all creativity. Those kinds of things I like enjoying and seeing is engineering, is architecture, um, is physics. Yeah. But yeah, it, and then you add on top of all that uh, two wonderful performances and Damon and then Christian Bale and a natural chemistry there that just clicked from the from the word go. Uh, and in other great, fantastic supporting roles as well. Um, it was wonderful, man. And it looks great. The sound design. I'm telling you, I'm calling it right Oof. now, man. That's going to be a heavy contender for sound yep. design um, for that movie. It, visually, it looks great. There's a couple of shots I was hoping to see mm-hmm. going into this that I saw. Uh, so, yeah, if, if you – it's still in theaters. Yeah, if you haven't yep. uh, checked out 4V Ferrari, man, it's, I, it's, it's a good – I'm not going to say it's a feel-good movie, but it's, yeah. just, uh, it's just a damn solid film. I, I concur with all of that. Now, um, we also watched Hustlers. Any yes. thoughts on that? Hustlers was better than I thought it was going to be, man. It Agreed. was better than I thought it was going to be. Um, 
I know you noticed there is a uh, an inverted theme to the three films that we saw. Uh, we're 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 all strippers on a pole we're trying all, to get. We're we're either dancing for the money or we're throwing the money. Yeah, we're either dancing for the money <laughs> or we're throwing the money. Um, yeah, it was, uh, and it kind of does feel like a uh, a modern day. The layout of the movie is almost like a modern day mob film. You kind of mm-hmm. see the rise. I think I said during the movie, usually in, in like a mob film like Goodfellas, you see the rise and then you see the fall. Here you see like a rise, fall, rise, fall, yeah. which you don't see too often. They, 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 and it doesn't feel overblown or stuff. It's not too long of a film. It's not crowded and packed too much in. It was a natural flow. Great editing, great pacing to this movie as well yeah. because they, they had the rise and then they had the fall. And I was like, well, we were like 45 minutes, 50 minutes. Before. <laughs> what else? Is he just going to be destitute? For? Nope. There's a rise back up again. You're like, oh, this is just getting better and better. It's just like life. It's just like life. I mean, it's based on. Based on the real <laughs> yeah. story, so, it's just know. like someone's life. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I enjoyed it. Yeah, right on. And Jennifer Lopez, I think, as a supporting actor, is really strong in this. I would not be surprised if she uh, gets a nomination for best supporting actors. Uh, I'd be lying if I said I hadn't voted for her. There you go. <gasps> How do you reveal that? Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, we saw Parasite. We saw Parasite, which, at least for me, I thought was a great film. But not my favorite film this year. I was a little dis- uh, not disappointed in the film. I was disappointed in myself that Had from you hyped it up for yourself. N- no, no, no. That everybody I know that has been part of the bong hive uh, that has loved this film. That I was like, it is really good, but it didn't hit me like it hit everybody else. Apparently, really, I enjoyed the shit out of that movie. Right on. I just wrote a, wrote a one hundred word review for it not too long ago. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, uh, I yes, I very much enjoyed the hell out of that movie. It's a little bit of class, not warfare, but uh, oh no, I'd say it was class warfare. warfare. All right, then it has a class warfare. Some very unexpected twists happen mm-hmm. there. It's very well paced. Yep, I do believe it's very deftly directed. Absolutely. I, I I know. Oh, and I, I don't know the name of the theater because I've never actually been in there. But I have to pass it to get to the Regal. Uh, is that on my uh, Manor. Yes, they were showing it as of last week. Cool. I'm not sure if it's still showing at the time of this recording, but if you're in the Charlotte area, do a little bit of research. It might still be playing around somewhere. Go check that out. I would absolutely recommend seeing it in a theater if you can. I don't think uh, it it is something you should wait for a home release. If you if it's just hard getting in the theater, then go for it. It's absolutely worth seeing. The performances are solid. The yeah. themes are very, very strong and evocative. But I just, for some reason, I was like, okay. Cool. Whereas with Oksha and Snowpiercer, I, I felt something yeah. really, really big. Me and Chris Baker were supposed to go out drinking. And he's like, hey, just got invited to Parasite. And I was like, I totally understand. <laughs> <laughs> go see that movie. So, so right yeah, on. yeah, that was the uh, that was marathon. I also saw Queen and Slim. Uh, what you think? The other day, uh, maybe Monday. I can't remember. I, whew, whew, man, that movie was some wild business. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, it was, again, man, there's a lot of movies that have come out this year that were, I, I came into 2019 looking at the list like, ah, it's going to be, a, it's going to be an all right. It's, like, it's going to be end game blowing everybody out, and then mm-hmm. we'll see what else happens. But, man, I've been thoroughly surprised by a lot of movies this year. There's been some quality shit in the back half of this year, uh, Queen of Slim being one of those. I have very real performances. Um, I expected uh, the... The cohesion to happen a lot sooner between the two than it actually does. Uh, I love that it didn't. I love that it did. I think that would have been a little bit more cliched. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Bukim Woodbine, who I haven't seen in <laughs> I don't know how long. I was like, he's fascinating in this movie, he's man. He's really good. He's really good. Um, yes, I look forward to more things written by Lena Waithe to see what else she comes up with. Uh, a little upset she didn't appear anywhere in the movie as far as I know. Uh, I would have liked to have seen her pop up in there somewhere. I I've only seen her in maybe a handful. I can only think of one thing off the top of my head that she's been in without checking out IMDb. And Go uh, watch Master of None on Netflix, all of you. I watched one episode of that and couldn't get into it. Never, oh. never, never went back, which oh. isn't just, hey, hey, I've still only seen three episodes of The Mandalorian, and by this point, there's five. Good so, night, everybody. Hey, I haven't seen Punisher season one or two, Jessica Jones season three, uh, no Darede- Daredevil season three. Yeah, Daredevil season three. I have a lot of TV shows I'm missing out on. Terrible. I know. It's so bad. But I've watched so many good movies. In fact, we have today our main topic, which is part one, 
Films part of one. the decade. Man, this is the first Cinnamon two-part episode. Woo. I like this idea, sir. Uh, I've just seen it float around Twitter for the last couple of days. Yeah. Last maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe a week or two. I don't know. Time is really fluid right now. It uh, really <laughs> is. <laughs> I, I woke up today and I was like, oh, what year is this? I woke up this morning to go to work and I was like, what day is it? Got home. I think I managed to get like an hour nap. And I woke up and I was like, what day is this? <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's. It's yeah. been, it's been a lot. so yeah. Last week or two, I've been seeing this theme pop up on Twitter, and I was like, ah, well, those crazy film Twitter kids. And you were like, let's do this, and I was like, well, I'm resigned to it. Let's roll <laughs> with it. <laughs> let's roll with it. Well, and in particular, the thing about films of a decade, more than anything else with film, it's what you love is subjective. Yeah, what you love is subjective, and at least in my case, I try to have an objective view with my reviews, mm-hmm. but it's more or less impossible because each film hits people in a subjective way. Correct. Uh, so trying to come up with a list of the films of the decade is really, really hard mm-hmm. because you can look at it from what's the best film, what's the best film to you film, or what's your favorite film in which you would rewatch it and rewatch it and rewatch it. That's exactly what I did. Because... And to me, my favorite film that I rewatch, rewatch is the best film <laughs> of the year. Exactly. <laughs> so this is why it's particularly tricky. But uh, so what we're doing with this part one, we're looking at 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014. That is Correct? the case. That is the case. Okay. So 2010. 2010 is our number number one start. Yes. It's the year that brought us films like The A-Team, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, The Book of Eli, Daybreakers, How to Train Your Dragon, Inception, Megamind, and many, many more. What did you go with for your number one? Uh, 2010, man, there's only one possibility. It's, it, <clears throat> you, it's so weird because you're like, oh, this list is horrible. For me, everyone was like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, it's Inception, man. I have seen Inception about a million times. I still haven't figured out that math yet. Watch it a million times. Um, <laughs> you haven't figured out the math of the movie or how you've seen it a million times? <laughs> Both. <laughs> <laughs> um, it At that time that it came out, I was like, I've <laughs> we've never seen anything like this before. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love a heist film. I love science fiction. You give me a science fiction heist film of a person, the information in his brain, but no, you actually put a reverse heist film? <laughs> it's the most Chris Nolan-y shit of all time. Yeah. Um, and we it, haven't seen Tenet yet. Yeah, we haven't seen Tenet yet, although word on the street is there will be a full Tenet trailer attached to Star Wars. Nice. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's word on the street. I already forgot where I heard that word on the street from. Anyways, um, he is my favorite film director for a reason, and this is a very big part of that reason. I think it is a phenomenal cast. I, I love, and I, I appreciate a good one, two man heist joints, but you give me that ensemble heist, like this is your role, this is your role, this is your role. Who's gonna fuck up? Because someone's <laughs> gonna fuck up and throw the whole wrench into the joints, unless it's Ocean Eleven. That shit runs way too smooth. Um, but. They have Everything the problems. Everything is accounted for in that film. <laughs> Everything. There is not a single flaw in their plan. They uh, didn't account for a broken hand or dead batteries. Because, you know. Matt you, Damon accounted you, for dead batteries. You, you, you have lo- the backups. You, you take your eye off the ball and that's <laughs> when things go wrong. <laughs> you lose focus for one, <laughs> one second. second. That's what it is. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, and it, it, is, it is a wonderfully shot. I was so invested in the whole business of Inception that I... I thought we were, I would forgotten that there was a layer above a layer. I thought we were at layer two the whole time. They cut back to the van hit, and I was like, oh, shit, that's right. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, they cut back to the plane, and I was like, oh, that's right, they're in a plane the whole time. Uh, I was I was very deep into that film. Um, that's when I was finally on board the uh, Ken Watanabe train. Mm-hmm. Uh yeah, there's, there's. I mean, I've, I've said enough on other podcasts about Inception, but damn, do I love that film. Uh, when I did my 24 hours of sci-fi marathon, uh, Inception was somewhere uh, somewhere during the, the daytime. Right on. Yeah, while the sun was out. Good right. movie. Great movie. It It is a very solid flick. It's part of the reason why it was in my list of possibilities. Mm. But I went with Tron Legacy. Oh, man. Uh, I know somebody said on Pop Riga that when they get a new something, a new soundbar, new TV, new something, that's what they put on to like test it all out. I want them to release it in 4K. Yeah. I love that movie. I love Love that movie. Love it. I was a fan of Tron as a kid, but mm-hmm. I wasn't deep into the lore, and I didn't, you know, own it or or whatever else. I just was always a fan of it. I liked how it looked. Yeah. Uh, and you know, born in 1980, the graphics of the original Tron were mind bending at the time. <laughs> you know. So whereas we look at it now, and, and yeah, it's very dated, but at the time it was really impressive. And with Tron Legacy, they took what we knew 
and they created something um, instead of being a sci-fi spectacle. What I like about it is it's it's fathers and sons. It's philosophical. It's is the de aging tech on Jeff Bridges great? It's no, <laughs> early stages. Yeah, early stages. yeah. And I mean, we even watched some stuff. There was stuff in the Irishman, and we've talked about it before. That uh, even that to me wasn't all that great. A little rubbery. It. That's why Scorsese is all mad because Marvel figured it. Out. <laughs> Marvel, we're knows not it. getting into that. Because <laughs> uh, Scorsese not entirely wrong, but. Uh, with Tron Legacy, that soundtrack by Daft Punk is so flipping good. Yes, it might and, be my number one soundtrack. And Michael Sheen is caster. Oh, I love him so, so much. He's in the movie for the right amount of time, man. Just so the perfect. perfect amount of time. So perfect. But Tron Legacy might be my second favorite Fathers and Sons movie. Really? Yes. What's your number one? Uh, my number one is number 100 on the 100 for 100 podcast. Oh, so yes. we won't talk about that yet. Yeah. Okay. But uh, yeah, I just I love everything about it. I actually went and saw that it came out on the 17th of December, if I'm remembering right. And my birthday is the 19th, so that was my birthday weekend movie. Boom. And I regret nothing. Good, good. Uh, yeah, that's a that was a quick Blu-ray purchase for me when it came out. I that's one of those movies. I have a handful of movies that if I'm doing something or I got to be on the I know I got to be on the phone for an extended period of time or something, and I just want to watch something on mute, man. I go to Tron Legacy. I go to Atomic Blonde. Right on. There's a couple of joints I go to there. And this is how I knew I married well. When we uh, moved into our house in 2013, our television died, oh, and no. we had some extra cash that you know from the move that we ended up just having. So it was like, let's get the, we have the space, let's get the TV. And at the time getting a certain size was automatic 3d and crystal, whatever holiday or birthday after that, she got me the uh, Tron legacy Tron collector set oh, that has nice. Tron legacy in 3d Tron legacy in Blu-ray and the original Tron in Blu-ray. Oh, yeah. And I was like, yeah, yeah. I love you. Wife. <laughs> Good on you. Crystal. So 2011, 2011, the year that brought us Fast Five, Captain America, the first Avenger, Attack the Block, Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, 50-50, Kung Fu Panda 2, Sherlock Holmes, A Game of Shadows. Uh, <laughs> although I do, I, I very much enjoy Game of Shadows, and I think Jared Harris is the best Moriarty we are apt to get. Um, Andrew Scott would have an argument with you. And I would completely ignore him <laughs> as he yelled at me because I don't like his Moriarty at all. Oh. Uh, Jared Harris, however, amazing. Uh, right. It was going to be Attack the Block, but then it also gave us uh, two films you didn't mention, which are the two that I'm still debating over, <laughs> The Raid. The ra Oh, good call. And it gave us Hannah. So which one are you going with? Hannah. I love the ever-living flip out of this movie. Um, I don't care much for the Amazon version that we have gotten. Oh, the uh, TV show? Earlier this year. I am trying to vamp because I can't remember who directed it. Uh, Joe Wright. Joe Wright directed his church around it. Um, Eric Bana, a.k.a. the hardest substance on earth. Eric Bana. <laughs> 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 which is a joke me and my friend have had for about 20 years now. And um, – uh, Kate Blanchett, Tom Hollander in this movie as well. It's a nice little cast of people. You know, the, uh, you know, Eric Bana has, this is, you know, his daughter trained her in the wild, just in nothing but survival. That's all he's trained her on, a former federal agent himself. I do believe he was CIA or just a, the, any kind of government, insert three letter government organization <laughs> here. It's pretty much what he was. And circumstances caused her to, you know, caused them to be fleshed out. Into the open, Kate Blanchett knows, hey, I guess she's got to get clapped up or my career's in jeopardy. And that's pretty much, and you're off to the races. She's trying to survive, and they're trying to get her killed. You know, and he's trying to catch like up. Like you with, do. Yeah, like you do. Harry Panda trying to catch up to her and make sure that does not happen. Um, amazing, amazing action sequences in this. This is what put me on the map with Shersha Ronan. Uh, this is what put me on the map for Joe Wright. Uh, put Eric Bannon back on my map. There is some amazing cinematography. The camera moves real well in this movie, especially there's a uh, a, a one-take fight sequence, mm -hmm. which almost made my uh, one-take list that we did right way, way back in episode three, four, whatever it was. Uh, yeah, that is, if you have not watched Hannah, and Lord knows the BBC plays damn near every other Saturday, <laughs> I've watched that work about six times. Um, go ahead and do yourself a favor and check out Hannah. I love that movie. It's a little small, like, mid-budget action film. And it didn't get a whole lot of, you know, press. Yeah. But everybody I know that has seen it loves it. I was okay with it. Never mind then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it, it's it's probably a movie that I didn't give enough attention to. I've heard some great things about it. I eventually watched it, and I was like, oh, I've seen this now. 
Yeah. Uh, but it didn't resonate with me in any any big way. And I am disappointed in myself for not remembering The Raid because that movie is flipping amazing. Damn right it is. It has changed action films. Yep. Due to its sheer existence. <laughs> it is the the best Die Hard ripoff that we have seen so far. Sort of a reverse Die Hard. Uh, no, maybe second If, if you want to, because... Maybe you guys put uh, Dread, Dread on the list then. Maybe. Well, yeah, and Dread and The Raid came out around the same time, but they're nowhere near connected. Yeah. Those two are would be a phenomenal... Double feature? Double feature. You're they absolutely damn would. right. But, but... But neither to one keep of them us, are Christmas films like Die Hard. Neither one of them... Mm. Anyway... It's not Christmas unless Hans falls off. Knock down the tower. Damn straight. Uh, it's about to be Christmas in my house. <laughs> probably next week. Uh, don't pick on me for mine. And I'll explain why. My film of 2012, excuse me, 2011, is a uh, really grindhousey film. Drive Angry. Mm. Nicolas Cage, Amber Heard, William Fitner. It is... A deliciously bad, amazingly awesome movie. I expected some bullshit on your list somewhere. I just didn't know where it was going to come. Let me explain. Please do. Let me explain. This will be brief because we've got plenty more to discuss. But Drive Angry, it hit theaters and a sneak came to Charlotte. I like Nick Cage, uh, but I was like, "Mm, I'll wait for that one on DVD. And I've regretted not seeing it in the theater ever since. It is balls to the walls. Knows exactly what kind of movie it is. Yeah. Nick Cage has a sex scene, fully clothed, where he does nothing. <laughs> and when the woman's like, why aren't you moving? He's like, uh, I never, why, why didn't you take off your clothes? He's like, I never undressed before a gunfight. And she's like, what? And then, yes, <laughs> he has a gunfight while having sex with this woman. Oh, Jesus Christ. It's that kind of movie. And uh, for me, it'll always have a special place in my heart. I got seriously ill in uh, 2014. Seriously ill. We thought it was food poisoning. Turns out I had the flu. Oh, okay. And on New Year's Day, we eventually went, all right, I need to go to the hospital. And I was in renal failure. And I was, I, I, they literally were like, if you hadn't shown up, you'd, you'd be done. Chris was pregnant at the time. So I was like, I want to meet my child. And uh, one night while <laughs> I was. I also want to be a real boy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but one night I was up. I could Because you don't go to the hospital to sleep. You're supposed to be there to get better, and it's too damn noisy to rest or do anything else. But I was I was up late, uh, and I couldn't sleep, and Drive Angry was on, and I was doing some exercises, and I was just laughing my ass off and watching that movie while doing this thing. And and uh, so Drive Angry will always have a special place in my heart. Oh, there you go. Drive so, Angry, the movie that nearly killed Doug. It saved my life. F oh. you. So 2012 brings us movies like Ted, Jack Reacher, Skyfall, Looper. Let's see what else I got. Paranorman, Seven Psychopaths, Wreck-It Ralph, and of course, Marvel's The Avengers. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> of course, there's nothing else. No, as soon as we made this list, I went, all right, so 2012 is The Avengers, and then I worked from there. Uh, I, what, what else can you say? It's, it's, it's Marvel's The Avengers. They, we, we're, yeah. What's yours? <laughs> there's nothing you can I, say about the event that hasn't already been said by a million people a million times. I, I I had a tough time with this because there's so many great Marvel films and so many Marvel films that came out in the last 10 years. So while trying to think of it, I was like, well, this is great and this is great. And Marvel's The Avengers is still so, so flipping good. A franchise of franchises, baby. Uh, yep. And uh, I figured you were going to do that. So I instead went. Went with Seeking a Friend for the End of the World. Oh, yeah. yeah. Have you seen that? No, I haven't. It's actually directed by the same uh, Lorraine, and I, I apologize if I mispronounce this, Lorraine Scafarna, who also did Hustlers. Right. Who also did Hustlers. She wrote and directed this. This is a little joint that is depressing as shit and amazing. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Uh, it is Steve Carell and Kira Knightley, along with a slew of other cast members, where a... Meteor is about to hit the Earth, and we're in the last days of existence. There's literally nothing that can be done. The movie starts with Steve Carell sitting in a car with his wife, who, by the way, is played by his actual wife, Nancy. Uh, Yes. And they're listening to the radio, and the essentially Armageddon story has happened, except they didn't destroy the asteroid. (laughs) They listen to it, and, and she just gets out of the car and walks off. That is it. And so the rest of the movie is Steve Carell trying to go through his life, and he ends up meeting this woman who just goes through a breakup, and she wants to get home. Well, it's Kira Knightley. She lives across 
the ocean. Okay. And he's like, uh, I know someone with a plane. So they end up going on this trip together to get to the plane to try and get her home. And you've got Adam Brody, Connie Britton, uh, Roger Aaron Brown, I think if I'm re- reading my handwriting right, Rob Hubel, Rob Corddry, Melanie Linsky, Amy Schumer, Patton Oswald, Martin Sheen, and many, many more that just show up. I love Melanie Linsky. Yeah. Oh, she's phenomenal. phenomenal. So it is not a happy watch, but it is so good. Excellent. So that brings us very quickly to 2013, the year that brought us Fast and Furious 6. Her, American Hustle, I have to mention because thank God for me is a line Crystal repeats all the damn <laughs> I time. Love American Hustle. Uh, Clatter with a Chance of Meatballs 2. This is the end. About time, stand up, guys. Mm-hmm. And you went with. <clears throat> it's 2013. 2013. There's a movie that is noticeably missing off your list. I'm just giving a short rundown. Mm-hmm. But what is missing from my list? A movie that is notably, notably <laughs> missing from your list that I almost feel is purposeful that it is not on said list that I did not like when I first saw, but has gotten better and better and better on rewatch. And it is a Man of Steel. Ooh. Yes, yeah, that's, the greatest that's... Superman movie that has come out. Second greatest Superman movie that has ever come out, live action. Um <clears throat> <clears throat> <laughs> Ignore me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. A Republican just showed up. <laughs> I have something in my throat. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry you were saying. Man of Steel. Yes. Oh, man. It's uh, amazing. Visually, man. It, it, I don't know why it didn't click the first time. I was like, this movie looks amazing. I can give you a few reasons why it might not have. Oh, my God. But please continue. This many, is your. This is yours. Many more reasons why it did. <laughs> please stop flicking me off, sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, Henry Cavill, uh, Amy Adams as our second best Lois Lane. Uh, oh, man, it's so good to see Lawrence Fishburne in there. It's Perry White, man. He he plays a good authoritative figure. Yes, I does. think that uh, Perry White was, or Lawrence Fishburne was born to play authoritative figures. And Larry on the boat <laughs> in Apocalypse Now. <laughs> um <laughs> And Michael Shannon doing what Michael Shannon normally does in movies is... Uh, I will find him! ...be sh- scene-chewingly villainous. Oh, he's, Between this he's and uh, The Shape of Water, man. He loves to chew some scenery. Knives Gary out. Gary Oldman somewhere good. like, let me take some notes real quick. <laughs> scene chewing. Yeah, he's also pretty damn good. In one particular scene, he shines in Knives Out. Oh, yeah. Um, it, yeah, yeah. The story of uh, what's like the first week on the job for Superman like? The first day on the job, really. And that is what we get. Uh, it is slaughter and destruction! Mostly by him. Yeah. Mostly by him, yeah. Uh, you know, it's a learning curve when uh, an alien is coming <laughs> to kill you. <laughs> that's, that's how we like our heroes, murdering half the populace. Yeah, well, well it's not like he was out there snapping necks all over the place. Uh, circumstances. No, he definitely did do it. He definitely snapped a neck. Uh, but yes, yes, I think Henry Cavill is the best version of Superman we are apt to get. Um you know, we've had this. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> we've had this discussion. Almost, almost every sentiment somehow ties back to, to Man of Steel. But yeah, we, we've talked about it. We know you're not a fan. I fucking love this movie. Awesome. It is what it is. It it is, and I am, and I say this sincerely. I'm trying not to laugh, <laughs> just because of the the face you're making at me right now. I'm trying to be sincere. I am so glad that you enjoy it. I am so glad that there are other people that do because, again, it's the films that connect with us is very subjective. Uh, certainly, we're about to get Crisis on Infinite Earths that the CW is putting out, mm-hmm. and they're going to give us a couple of really great Superman yeah. anyway. But we said cinematic and not television. So, true, true, you, know, true, true. you know, you do you. Right on, man. Yeah, you should be happy with this placement. On 100 for 100. <laughs> Here's a hint. 101. Duck will uh, be happy. <laughs> 101. So, um, my number, <laughs> my one for 2013, goes in the absolute opposite direction. Oh, a bad film. No. Okay. Uh, much Do About Nothing. Mm, Joss Whedon. Joss Whedon. I Joss did Whedon. not watch that joint. I do highly recommend it, but it's it's the kind of film that if you're a Shakespeare fan, mm-hmm. which I am, and Much Ado is sort of my number one film, uh, s- number one play yeah. of his, uh, there's certainly some more complex ones. Titus Andronicus is fucked up, although the uh, adaptation of of that with Anthony Hopkins is amazing. And a oh, rough it's watch. just called Titus. It's just called Titus. That's right. It is. Uh, if you've not seen it and do like Shakespeare, trigger warning for a lot, a lot. No, I'm interested. That is in, that is that is in that is a hard watch, but it is beautifully directed. All of a sudden, I can't remember the director's name. Uh, she did uh, the Lion King on Broadway. She did um, Spider Man. 
Can't Stop the Night or whatever the heck it was. She's actually a man. Uh, she's a phenomenal director, and I'll come up with a name while you're doing your next one. But anyway, much do about nothing. Joss Whedon directed it during his break, I believe, from Avengers. Mm-hmm. It was his anniversary gift to his now ex-wife. Yes. That was sort of how they spent it, but they brought in all of their friends. So basically, if you've ever seen anything with Joss Whedon, it starred them. Amy Acker, Alexis uh, Denisoff, Nathan Fillion, Clark Gregg, Reed Diamond, Franz Kranz, uh, Sean Marr, Ricky Lindholm, Ashley Johnson, Tom Link, and a bunch of others in his house with his family and friends making this adaptation. And it's wonderful. Uh, black and white joint. And uh, if you like Shakespeare, check it out. Boom. There you go. Done and done. 2014. It's we been are, on my list for a while. We are almost at the end. 2014 brought us films like Guardians of the Galaxy, X-Men Days of Future Past, Captain America the Winter Soldier, Big Hero 6, Chef, and John Wick. What? is your number one of that year. We go back to the Nolan Well Interstellar. <laughs> oh, I love this movie. The quote unquote modern day 2001 Space Odyssey. I love Interstellar. Um it is to me possibly the Chris Nolan Magnum opus. Um well, we haven't seen Tenet. We'll see. Maybe my he might top it. Up he up. might top. But up until then. But up until moment. then, man. Yeah, I mean, Dark Knight is up there. Inception's up there, but man, and still some whole other shit. It's It combines two things that I love. A good movie and a long movie. And this is a great long movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and also combines Wait, wait. I thought it was science fiction and heist. I'm so confused right now. <laughs> well, they're, they're, can, can we roll back the tape? They're can heisting it? the stars. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Sci-fi yeah, and heist. Those are the two things you love. <laughs> I, I can love more than two things. Yeah. It's the two of many things that I love. <laughs> <laughs> the words BS. <laughs> uh, I mean, you, Matt McConaughey, of course, your lucky charm, Michael Caine, and Hathaway, who I'm not the hugest fan of, but she's there. Uh, she's really was, good. Uh, Chastain, Casey Affleck, up in this business as well. There's a lot of good shit in this movie, man. I like... I I genuinely think that that is where the world is headed years from now. We're just fucked. And they are at the last days of the world being fucked. And they got to figure out what the hell they're going to do, man. If humanity, if mankind wants to survive, the only answer is the stars. Yeah. Um, and, and they set to that task, man. They, they sent out Matt Damon, a couple other jabronis, and, uh, they, and they, they found a little something. And it is the journey of can you sacrifice not ever seeing your family again in order to secure a future for mankind? It was a... A discussion that just popped up yesterday in Paprika with uh, Reed Richards, Mr. Okay. Fantastic. Mm. Can you sacrifice never being around your family to secure the future of mankind? Make sure Dr. Doom doesn't just fuck shit up on a daily basis or the scrolls will come invade. And I was like, yes, yes, yes. It is the future of all human beings, no matter how shitty they are. If you have a, a, a possibility to secure their future... You make the sacrifices, and Matthew McConaughey makes the sacrifice. I will always make that sacrifice. How many horror mil- films have you seen? Because there's usually that one dude who's like, "F the rest of this train, I need to survive." Yeah, there's there's a lot that, of that. that. That that's like every horror film with a zombie outbreak. Any there's always that one dude who's like, "But I'm so wealthy, I have to live to spend all of my money with civilization shit." <laughs> Well, I'm, not, I'm not sure book, who that book, was right the, there. But. The Book of Eli has that with Gary Oldham. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's always going to be your, your population of asshats. But what about the guy who's just – what about the other guy whose story on C of, like, I'm just trying to get back to my family to do the right thing? They also need the I, same same bit of consideration. I, I wasn't arguing that point. You said if it comes down to your family or all of humanity, you're going to choose all of humanity, to which yes. I say – there's still some asshats. Yeah, but are you really going to sacrifice the, the poor innocents out there just because of the asshats? Never. I won't, anyway. You won't. I there won't. There we go. Uh, yeah. And You're a good it person. Is, You're a good person, Daryl. Oh, stop. Uh, and it comes down to, you know, Matt McConaughey struggling with this sacrifice and the fact that uh, heavy math is put in in this movie. I love good sci fi with some heavy math in there. So that long robot is amazing. TARS. TARS is a great robot. Uh, the fact that uh, just because they are so close to a black hole, the gravity is affecting time. They're down there for what, 45 minutes? It's 27 years up in space. They left my man all by himself. Uh, only to pop up on an Amazon show. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it is It is beautiful. It is dramatic. I think it is Matthew McConaughey's best role ever. I think it is uh, possibly one of Anne Hathaway's best roles, because it certainly ain't Catwoman. Um, 
It is. She was really good as Catwoman. I though. thought she was about the blandest Catwoman of all time. Um, I think that more came from the writing than it came from her performance. Mm-hmm. Also, her performance didn't help. Uh, yeah, it is that scene where she is ripping off the rich dude and the cops come running in is phenomenal. And that's the only scene anybody ever references. Uh, but yeah, Interstellar, man, check that shit out if you haven't. And if you have, uh, it's probably time for you. When I did my 24-hour sci-fi marathon, I put that smack in the middle of the night, man. Because <laughs> I was like, I know some shit that's going to need to keep me up at 2 a.m. And it sure did. Right on. Right on. My well, eyes were burning by that time. My uh, my pick doesn't go in a different direction because you went with something incredibly thoughtful, incredibly in-depth, although my film doesn't have anything as on the nose as Dr. Man. <laughs> And he ends up being a jerk. I, surprise! Uh, the surprise is Matt Damon. <laughs> no, no. Like, him oh, getting lost a, in he's space. He's an is, asshole. Yeah, that's that's, that's, that's pretty much his thing. <laughs> uh, I went with a movie that I feel was quite literally the best one that year. It had been in the running, if, as I recall, for the Academy Award for that year. And uh, I do believe it should have won. I forget what did win in 2014. But Birdman or The Unexpected Virtue of Ignorance. This film uh, by Alejandro Inuratu is amazing. We were talking about 1917 at the beginning of this podcast, which, if you're not familiar, was shot uh, to be edited as though it were one take the entire film. And once you notice the seams where they do that, you sort of notice it a little bit, but it's still shot so beautifully. And that one take aspect in 1917 is so perfect for the storytelling that it works. It just, it's wonderful. And with Birdman, they, he does the exact same thing where everything is tended to be done as a one take. Right. And it works so well because the film itself is about a play being put on. So the film itself is as though like a play. A show about a show. Which I love any film that is sort of a movie about a movie or a show about a show or just where it's almost meta in that layers and depth. Right. Michael Keaton gives one of the best performances of his career in Birdman. Uh, I haven't watched it, unfortunately, in a few years, but it is one of my favorites. When, um, when it came out on Blu-ray and being able to watch it at home with my, my old-ass surround sound, but still Effective. It, 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 it does the job. It is just so, it sounds beautiful, it looks beautiful, and it is so heartbreaking. Birdman, my friend, one of the rare films to pull off Best Picture and Best Director. It did win Best Picture. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> Yay for Doug Davidson. Yay! Because it is amazing. I, I absolutely love that movie. So that is, that concludes our first part of a two-part. We have a bit of time to discuss our challenges, but please do come back with us for our next show when we talk about 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, and 2019, the years that brought us films like Creed, Star Wars The Force Awakens, Kubo and the Two Strings, Colossal, The Shape of Water, Zootopia, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, Spider-Man, The Peanut Butter Falcon, Knives Out, Won't You Be My Neighbor, Hereditary, Hearts Beat Loud, American Animals, Rocket Man, and of course, my number one favorite premiere, please go see it when it comes back through with Fathom Events. Doug paid five cents for that plug right there. No, I got um, paid nothing. I just love Promare. <laughs> the soundtrack should be showing up at my house. There we go. Today. We go. I can't um, wait to listen to it. So our challenges yeah. this week. You gave me Dolomite is My Name, yes. the Netflix documentary. Not documentary. Might biopic. Well been. Uh, and I gave you The Man Who Killed Hitler and then The Bigfoot, which is uh, has been consistently in my top Everything. Films. Everything this you year. You somehow found a way to make it the top George Clooney movie. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> that is out of sight, film. by the way. Oh, I bet. well, well played, sir. Well, I love it. I mean, it's, it's it like is a heist two. film, so it has to be something you'd respect. Hey, there you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that George Clooney could pull off a heist looking all that rugged and handsome. That's the science fiction part of it. Ah, uh, no, he's he's just always, always handsome. He's just always handsome. It's always handsome. This Even goes back to his doctor. Number two for me. Oh, what's your number one with him? Oh, man, it's Oceans, man. The other heist movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if a heist movie was going to beat another heist movie, it had to be yeah. the heist movie. The heist movie. Uh, but yeah, uh, well, you go first. So don't mind money. Sure. What do you think? Dude, thank you. I needed to see this film anyway. It has been getting a lot of notoriety. It's not just because it's a film Netflix released or the fact that it's a biopic. It's actually that... People have been talking about it. There's been Oscar discussion, award consideration. 
uh, this deserves all of the talk it is getting. I mean, it's they've already got a, a leg up with a costume designed by Ruth Carter, who has won an Oscar for her work on a series of films. Mm-hmm. Although she's only won one, and I think it was for Black, Black Panther. Black Panther! But, and it's not the fact that this film has a cast of incredible actors. Or the fact that, as I just mentioned a little bit ago, I love a movie about making a movie. Mm-hmm. But it's this... For those of you that aren't familiar, Dolomite is my name. Is the story of Rudy Moore, a hey, multi. It's Rudy Ray Moore, sir. Rudy Ray Moore always sorry. said that way. Apologies, Rudy Ray Moore, who is a multi hyphenate. He he to call him a hustler would be disrespectful. I think dude is the ultimate hustler. Yeah, and but he. It's not just about I want to be famous. It's I want to do something well and be famous for doing that thing well. But how we define doing something well is, of course, subjective. And for Rudy, it was about putting out the something that would resonate with people. Mm-hmm. And he, according to the film, happened upon this personality of Dolomite. And he turned that from a comedy persona live to records. And then eventually they made a series of films, though this one is all about the first film. Right. And what I love about it is, is that this film hides nothing in the fact that Rudy has no idea what he's doing. Right. Yes, that's that's the comedic aspect of the film, a lot of it. Well, but not just the fact that it's comedic, but it's also the way that Eddie Murphy portrays him is that he is not ignorant of what he doesn't know. He is right. firmly aware of what he doesn't know, and so he brings people in to do what he does. He is not going, well, we'll just we'll figure it out. I mean, he does a little bit of that, but it's in the sense of, yeah, I don't know, but... Every, let's bring everybody else in. So let's there's get the best man for the job that we can afford. <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. At our budget, and and so when he's got this crew of what seems like film students coming in to do stuff, and they're like, "We got no power." He's going, eh, yeah, "Bust sp- down the wall, splice it out, splice yeah, it out yeah, the just, neighbors, just just rip it off from over there." And they're going, yeah, "All okay. right, yeah. okay." <laughs> my my favorite moment has to be the sex scene, it's and, great and and the great. moment that happens before it, uh, because. Eddie Murphy, as as Rudy Ray Moore, he's not a pinnacle of male anything. Nope. But he's aware of it. Yes. And so he's having this wonderful conversation with Lady Reed, who's played by Divine Joy Randolph, who is phenomenal in this. I would love a Best Supporting Actress nomination. Um, it, she's not lead? She's not lead actress? I mean, she's part of the ensemble, so I don't, I don't yeah, know how that, to parse it I, out. That's why I attack. I think like Eddie is the one true lead. Everybody else in that movie is considered a supporting to me. Uh, I totally see that. I totally see that. But their conversation about how, from her perspective, her character's perspective, that you don't see people like them in film, right. and so the fa- so if you can't make it the sexiest thing, why not just make it funny? And the way that they, but he listens, and mm-hmm. it's collaborative, and it's fucking hilarious how yes. it all plays out. So I loved this film, and I actually ended up uh, nominating them as an ensemble. There you go. I, I think it is a great film. Yep. The the one line that really resonates, this whole movie resonates with me, mm-hmm. as I, I understand where Rudy is, or Eddie as Rudy is coming from mm-hmm. in this film. The one line is one I tweeted out, or I tweeted and posted about the other day. Um, when he said, I want the world to know I exist, mm-hmm. that's when I was like, yes, yeah. yes, this is a movie that understands what I am and who yeah. I'm about. And that's when I was in love from then on out. Um, the, I only have one minor nitpick mm-hmm. with this movie, and it's that at no point did we see Rudy give any credit to the people who told him these these types of stories, the, all the homeless hobos and whatnot. Yeah. That's my only source of contention with this movie. Uh, other than that, he took and parlayed like no one else has parlayed anything. Although I think, while I agree with you, maybe that's because Ru- I don't know if Rudy actually did ever in his life. And they do show us prior to that that he is looking for anything to hold on to. Mm-hmm. So the fact that he's just taking these things, they don't gloss over it. Yeah. So he's just taking, I mean, he's paying them, but they don't really know what they're being paid for. Yeah. Uh, so they're just doing it. And I think that sort of speaks to it as he did adjust and adapt and he did hone their stories to create mm-hmm. this persona. But I also have to throw a little bit of a hat tip to Wesley Snipes, who in a lot of ways Lovely. is sort of playing against type. Yeah. And he, he's usually so super masculine. And here he's doing some things that we haven't seen him do before. Right. And it's wonderful. Not just comedic, but the way he's delivering lines, the way the type of character he's portraying. And this cast has a 
slew of actors in it who do some good work even in small roles, but I uh, have to give a hat tip to him. Yeah, so. you're that long ass coke nail too. That shit always cracks me up whenever I see somebody with a coke nail. Um, yeah, he got his money and was out. Yes. <laughs> he even tells him, "Yeah, I uh, I just got hired to do this other gig, so I'm leaving. <laughs> yeah, I'll see the the film is over. We'll see you at the premiere. Uh, it won't, there, it won't premiere. So <laughs> bye. <laughs> Wait, what did this gut still hang? Yep. <laughs> God, I love that movie, man. Yep, loved it. Uh, yep. Now my and you gave me the man who on it could be a more different film. Yep, the man who killed uh, Hitler than the Bigfoot. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, Sam Elliott. All up throughout this business. Yep. Yeah, it is his movie. And boy, does Sam Elliott put in good quality work yep. in this joint. I, I, uh, I see why you give it the high praise that you give it. Um, it is it is not about the killing of Hitler and mm-hmm. Bigfoot. Those are just things that happened. Mm-hmm. And he treats them as things that, look, I was ordered to do this thing. Um, I did this thing. All right. All the legend that spun out of it. That's that's got nothing to do with me. I just did what I was ordered to do. I just want to live my life. And in essence, it is a man who wants to live his life. Mm-hmm. And it seems like he's got a, pr- a pretty just decent, peaceful, uh, little small town, homey type of. He's, got, he's just a man and his dog, yeah. man. And uh, I I admire people who live like that because I couldn't. Mm-hmm. I couldn't. I, I would bore myself to death. But he is complacent in who he is and where he's at in his life. Um and, you know, and then he's approached and says, hey, you're the motherfucker who killed Hitler, so you're probably the motherfucker who can kill anything. <laughs> we, 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 the, the Bigfoot's here, and uh, he's clapping up Canada. And we need to make sure that uh, what he does doesn't spread to the rest of the, you know, possibly the world. Yeah. Um, you know, and any hero's journey to get the refusal to call. Like, that's part of it. It's Luke not going to uh, Moss Eisley until, you know, he finds out that uh, old uncle and aunt got crisped out. So and he has he's like hey, fuck it no <laughs> <laughs> y'all figure it out and then you know what whatever made him change his mind made him change his mind but the, that that uh, that monologue of just the things he's done and who he's about to Ron Livingston in his dining room I think is that's a that's one for the monologue books yeah I it's think. A, it's quite devastating it's a great monologue I think between that the John Claude Van Damme monologue and JCVD have you seen JCVD not yet. That is, it's like a six minute long monologue. Right. And I was like, oh shit, John Clapton and Nick can act. Uh, that and the Bill Pullman Independence Day, those might be my top three monologues right there. Uh, you know, and it's, it's just a good, nice, slow paced, mm-hmm. nothing nothing to rush about. Even, even his whole mission of going to kill the Bigfoot, you know, any other writer, any other writer would try to put some action up in there. And no, no, not really. Matter of fact, a lot of just smash cut to wow. Well, that's one shot right there, and now yep. I just got to go mop up the rest of it. And it's there's nothing, there's nothing fast paced about it. He's just yep. very methodical in what he does. And this movie is very methodical. The filmmaking was very methodical. I enjoyed the shit out of this movie. Yay! Well done, sir. Thank you. Well done. I think that is it, man. That is it. And we have three minutes left in the studio. Yeah. We uh, before we get out of here because we have issued challenges this time around. Mm. Uh, Daryl. We are, it sounds like we're once again doing the complete opposite of the other. So you have challenged me to? Marriage Story, which is getting all sorts of buzz on the internet. Uh, the Adam Driver, Scarlett Johansson, it just dropped on Netflix a little while ago. Very good. Right on, right on. Uh, it is one that, unfortunately, <coughs> I was not able to fit in uh, before nominations. Mm-hmm. But based on everything I'm hearing, I will. I have to watch it anyway before voting. And it is apparently a devastating piece of work, from what I understand. So I am giving you the exact opposite of that. I'm giving Ace you... Ace Ventura, Pet Detective. The Peanut Butter Falcon. All right, then. Peanut Butter Falcon is one of my favorite movies of this year. Mm-hmm. And it is nothing if not wholesome and warm and full of love. Oh, I hate those kinds of movies. Then you are going to <laughs> super hate this. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it, man. I, I it was one of those joints that was on my radar to check out, and due to whatever reason or reasons, um, what month? Do you remember what month that came out? Uh, it was in the back half of it, the year. Yeah, it was in the fall, actually. Yeah, it was in the fall. Yeah. Uh, August, September, maybe. I think I was also uh, still in the middle of uh, my big wave of just working a million hours. You uh, yeah. aren't you doing that? Always. This is this is the the back end of my working a million oh, okay. hours. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I was looking forward to it. Just didn't get a chance to check it out. So I am looking forward to checking it out this go around. Well, it is available on digital DVD and Blu-ray. And if anybody listening has heard of it, 
do check it out. Oh, there's a whole discussion thread in Pop Rig about it, man. They, they had there a better been. There, there was. There was. Uh, all right. Uh, you got anything else before we sign on off, sir? Uh, I do not. Uh, by this point, Wonder Woman will have come out. We're supposed to be, I think, getting Birds of Prey trailer as well and a few others this week. Uh, of course, by the time we record again, Star Wars will have come out. So keep the conversation civil, folks. Get wild, you animals. <laughs> <laughs>